Welcome everyone! This is the fourth and the final video of the chapter. I won't waste any more time. Let's go ahead and try our corrected example program. Now we can upload the code to the development board. By default, the program won't start running because the debugger stops it at the beginning. So we need to manually start it by pressing resume or the F8 key on our keyboard. As we discussed in the first video, the counter's value should increment by one every second. Let's start the program and see if that's what happens. Looks promising. Well, looking at the LEDs, we are set to see that the expected counting has not happened, but as time goes by, all the LEDs light up, and then it seems as if nothing happened. This is where debugging comes in, because we can see the state of each variable, and even run the code at our own will. So we can go through the process step by step, which otherwise happens in the blink of an eye. Click on the reset button to terminate the program and restart it. Before we start running the program, put a breakpoint at the end of the loop. As described before, the execution will stop here and in every cycle afterward. But before we go any further, click on the add new expressions label in the expressions tab and enter the name of our variable, in this case counter. Every time the program stops, you can see the current value of the counter variable in the value column. Click on the run button. The counter variable has been set to 1 and LED4 is lit, so it seems that everything is good so far. Click on run again, let's see what happens. The counter variable is 2 as expected, but now both LED3 and LED4 are lit. This is no longer appropriate for us, since the value displayed by the LEDs is now 3, while the value of our variable is only 2. Now click on run again. Now the value of the counter variable is 3, and LED3 and LED4 are lit in the same way, which means 3. From now on, let's look at our program step by step, so that we can analyze its operation in more detail. To do this, let's use the step over button, since we don't want to see the inside of each function right now. The value of the counter changes to 4, and LED2 lights up, which in itself means the value is 4. So on reflection, our code is working correctly in the sense that the LEDs that show the correct value are lit, the problem is just that the others are not turned off. We've identified what's wrong with our program. Let's fix this problem. We have already created the reset LEDs function to turn off the LEDs, we just need to place it. The right place to do this, in this case, is line 100 in main.c. After that, we can upload the modified program by pressing the terminate and relaunch button. Let's see what happens. What do we observe? Everything is fine, the circuit counts up nicely. Well, that was our goal. It looks like everything is functioning properly. And just like that, darkness. What could be the problem? Before running again, it's worth thinking about where to put our breakpoint. That's a valid question. Since the counting has been done correctly, it is a good idea to put it at the end, say the 15th branch of the switch case, so that we can quickly step through the part of the code that is sure to work and continue debugging. Start the code, and after stopping at the breakpoint, start stepping. These 16 seconds are taking forever. And we've stopped. Once all the LEDs are lit, move on to increment the counter value further to 16, and then turn the LEDs off. However, since 16 is the default case, where we haven't written any code, nothing will change. The counter will not reset and therefore the LEDs won't light up either. Now that we know what the problem is, we can fix it by simply setting the counter variable to zero. You can do this by using an if statement after incrementing the counter. If the variable is 16, set it to zero, so you will be in the dark for about one second, then the LEDs will start counting. So far everything is fine, although we reached this point earlier. At least we haven't encountered any errors yet. It hasn't gotten worse. Great! 
After uploading the modified code, we are happy to see that our counter now works properly. Don't worry if you couldn't fix all the problems. The third example project for this chapter includes the corrected program. Ok, now everything works and is correct, but I'm sure everyone has asked the question, how does the microcontroller on the circuit know how to control each pin? Why did we set this up? To check this, we need to examine our code a bit more slowly than before, so let's start again. After entering the debug menu, click on the SFR tab to see the registers of the microcontroller. The IDE gives us a lot of help, for example, if you hover the cursor over each register, it will show its name. We will now examine the contents of the GPIOD register, which contains the four pins that are connected to the LEDs. We're interested in the MX underscore GPIO underscore init instruction. We can look into the details of this with the step into instruction or by pressing F5. We can see that we've switched to the GPIO.C file. The configuration of the pins is done by setting the parameters of GPIO underscore init struct. These parameters are set in the device setup window, which we've already done in the CubeMX while creating the project template. The settings will be applied by the hell underscore GPIO underscore init function, and the actual change is shown in the SFR window. The register changes in this tab are shown on a yellow background, making them easier to read. Why did the GPIOD mode register's subvalues 4, 5, 6, and 7 change? The answer is quite simple. We configured these pins to control the LEDs. We can verify this is in the main.h file. What we have set in the device configuration tool will be applied here, so LED4 belongs to the GPIOD4 pin, LED3 to the GPIOD5, LED2 to the GPIOD6, LED1 to the GPIOD7. Of course, we can refer to them as GPIOs, but this would greatly reduce the readability of our code, so we have the option to assign names. This is done by us in the .ioc file, and the mapping is done by the development environment during code generation using the hashtag defined directives. Let's move on to the fourth example code of the chapter, which contains another interesting bug. It functionally differs from the previous one in that here we do not display the variable's value on the LEDs, but rather the value of the power of 2 that is greater than or equal to the counter variable. Import the project the usual way. The required additional files are once again the LED.h and LED.c. After importing these, let's compile the program. After compiling, we see that we have received warnings, but there is no error in the code, so we can load it onto the circuit Let's do that. We expect it to count up nicely. So far so good. We're waiting for it to reach 8, but it never does. The operation does not meet our expectations once again. Our counter only counts to 7 and then restarts. Now, instead of looking in the debug menu, it is worth looking at the warnings first given by the development environment. After exiting debug mode, the warnings are no longer visible in the problem tab and they will not appear after rebuilding the project. This is a feature of the development environment. To make them available again, right click on the project name in the project explorer tab on the left and select clean project. This will make the compiler forget all previous information about the project and treat it as completely new, as if it had just been created or imported. Thus, when rebuilding, you will see the warnings again. These apply to cases of the switch case structure that are greater than 255. What could be the reason for this? It's clearly indicated by the compiler, namely that the value of each case exceeds the maximum value of the variable based on which the switch logic is performed. This variable's type is uint8 underscore t, or an unsigned integer with 8 bits. Its value varies between 0 and 255, 2 to the power of 8, minus 1. So this is not suitable for us, we need to select a type that is capable of storing larger numbers than this. The largest case value is 215, so uint16 underscore t is already suitable since its maximum value is 2 to the power of 16 minus 1. Let's upload the modified code. We're hoping the value of the counter now reaches 8 and continues. And there it is. 
I think we did a great job. Yes, indeed. As we can see, the counter now works as expected. We gained insight into the fact, which was only theoretical before, that it is always worth examining warnings and considering whether they cause errors in the subsequent operation of the code. If we had approached this case as we did before, i.e. by going straight to the debugging interface rather than by thinking through the warning, we would have had to wait until the program had cleared up to 255 and then examine the operation from there. There is also an additional function in the debug menu called the instruction stepping mode, which allows you to see how the code works at the assembly level. We're happy to see how much easier the C language makes it for us to create software. Not only can we work in a more readable way, but we can also combine the contents of several assembly instructions into one C statement. Because of these features, we use assembly relatively rarely, and it is always a good idea to debug within the C language first, and then go down to the assembly level only if we think we can't find a solution in C. As a final thought, I have one more thought-provoking topic. In the computer-oriented common language, our ears are not fully accustomed to the prefix giga, which is 10 to the power of 9, or mega, which is 10 to the power of 6. These may have been heard once or twice, but we are moving towards Terra, that is 10 to the power of 12. In the microcontroller's world, however, we are dealing with a completely different scale of magnitudes. In the lower right corner of the IDE, we find the build analyzer window, within which the memory region step provides us with useful information. You can see that we are in the order of kilos, which is 10 to the power of 3, but that is still plenty since we are only around 1% RAM usage in this case. This is extremely pleasing compared to the PC world, where the operating system uses 30 to 40% of memory without a question. In this case, our microcontroller doesn't run an operating system, unlike those devices on which you are currently watching this video. You might have guessed that I wouldn't bring all this up if in the future we didn't plan to discuss operating systems on microcontrollers. We'll talk about this in great detail in chapters 21 and 22, but for now, let's just be happy we don't have to worry about exceeding the microcontroller's memory. I hope everyone has reached this point in the chapter with the pleasant knowledge that should any errors occur in any programs, they will be able to find them and, if necessary, with the help of the internet, fix them. It is important not to look at bugs as a tragedy during a development phase and not to be discouraged by them. There will always be mistakes for everyone, this is the way of learning and moving on to the next level. As the saying goes, the code is never finished, we just stop developing it. Thank you for joining us. The written material and the example codes can be found on our website crystalclearelectronics2.eu. We announce new videos on our Facebook page, make sure you follow us. As always, have a great day. Bye. Bye bye.